Have you ever had a a mess to clean up, a big mess to clean up, whether it's in your garage or uh, in your kitchen or whether it's in your yard, maybe even in your car? That's where I, I find most of my messes, in the car. I, I don't know why, but everything seems to end up end up in the back seat or, or the passenger seat, papers and notes, books, and I've gotten a lot better. I clean up after myself now, you know, at first my wife had to uh, suffer with me, but uh, I learned to clean up, throw everything in a bag and, you know, make it look like as if I have some sense, some organizational skills. But have you ever had a mess to clean up and the mess is so bad that you don't know where to start. You look at the mess and you say, man, I know I have to clean this up. I know I have company coming in two hours. I know my wife is going to be frustrated with me. Whatever the reason is, you have a, uh, uh, some type of motivating force that says you need to clean it up. But the problem is, where do you start? Well, you have to start somewhere. Have you ever met anyone who doesn't know anything about the Bible? Have you ever tried to sow the seed of the gospel to someone who doesn't even know who Noah is? Someone who doesn't even know who Paul or Moses is? Uh, they just simply do not have any knowledge of the Bible. I, I have one time, and I tell you what, that was the most difficult Bible study I have ever, ever experienced. Because you can't take for granted. You can't assume they know anything. So you have to break everything down. You have to meet them where they are. You know, Paul found himself in this particular situation. I'm sure when he got to Athens, he said, where do I start? Look at chapter 17 of the book of Acts. Starting in verse 16, the Bible says, Now, when, now while Paul was waiting uh, for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he was reasoning in a synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of some strange deities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is, which you are proclaiming? For you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now Luke, in parentheses, adds his comment. He says, now all of the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. So we have the, uh, the plot. We see the beginning of this account of Paul uh, on his missionary journey going through the uh, city of Athens. And the city of Athens was at one point the center of the universe, as, as far as uh, the main place. You know, when we think of the main cities in today's world, we think of New York City, we think of Tokyo, we think of, uh, you know, the big metropolises uh, where everything takes place. Uh, the melting pots, the destination areas that people wish to go to at some point in their life. Now, uh, the Athens was at one point that place. But over the years, they started to lose some of their, some of their distinction and power. And, but they were still very proud of uh, who they were. 
And Paul, after he had to split up with Timothy and, uh, and Silas, found himself alone and in this city of Athens. And uh, this morning I would like us to just point out a few um, points that will help us in our day-to-day -day evangelism. There are some key points that Paul uh, that we can find in Paul's ministry that we can use today. Because Athens, in a lot of ways, remind me of the United States of America. I love this country. It's, it's a great country. But it seems like, especially this particular generation, that the understanding, the, the fundamental knowledge of who God is, is starting to dissipate. And when you meet people like this, you say, where do I start? Where do I start? It used to be common knowledge. No. Now we have to prove to people that there is a God and that this Bible is inspired. It's not about whether baptism is required. It's not about uh, instruments and, and singing, uh, things like that. No, the, 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 the problem now is convincing people that there is one God and that there is a word from God, proving that the Bible is inspired. But notice that Paul, when he, when he got to Athens, the Bible says in verse 16 that his spirit was being provoked within uh, him as he was observing the city full of idols. What the Bible is saying is that his soul was bothered. His soul was offended. It, he was angered at what he was seeing. And you can't do much evangelism unless you uh, are willing to help change some of the lives and some of the problems that we have in this world. If the sin in this world doesn't bother you, if it doesn't cause uh, anger to build up inside of you, uh, I doubt you do much evangelism. Because souls are dying. Paul saw all these idols, and I think uh, one historian has written that there were about 30,000 statues in Athens at one point. 30,000. Now, the population was about 10,000. So you have three idols for each person, roughly. When Paul saw this, he was disgusted. You know, my wife and I had, uh, we, we won, we didn't really win it, win a trip, but we uh, got a free trip to Vegas about four years ago before my daughter was born and we said, let's, let's go. Okay, it was a timeshare they wanted to show us and we'll go look at it and we'll, you know, have fun while we're there with, you know, finding any way for us to enjoy our lives before children come, you know. <laughs> our life has gotten better with Makai, by the way. <laughs> In case Makai listens to this uh, recording <laughs> 10 years from now, we love you. But when, you know, Jerry and I uh, hit the street, we walked around, we saw some things that were very offensive. Things that bothered us. And we could not believe some of the, the lewdness and the, and the sin. It was just out there as if it was uh, popular, as if everybody was doing it. Nothing was hidden. It was just out there. And they say that, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. They say that for a reason. But the, the, the point I'm trying to make is that we were bothered. We were offended. Uh, we did not go to certain areas. You know, uh, sometimes you run into area, an area on accident. And you say, I'm not going there anymore. If your soul is not bothered by some of the movies that are on television, some of the language you hear, some of the uh, lifestyles you see. If your soul is not bothered when you see uh, people who are using bad language on your job site, people who are dressing in a lewd and profound, uh, in, in perverse way, uh, just walking up and down the street, exposing their body and trying to, to pull people in to see them. If you're not offended by that, Take note, because your conscience might be becoming a little uh, dull or, or numb. 
That's exactly what Satan wants to happen. So when Paul enters into the city and his soul was, was, was bothered, and that was his fuel, he says, I've got to go in there and talk to these people. Although I'm, um, uh, I'm, I've been separated from Timothy and Silas, those are my, my back, those are my men. We, we trust in each other. We, we spread the gospel together. But uh, Paul knew he wasn't alone. Christ was with them. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, I will be with you even to the end of the age. When you go out there to spread the gospel, Paul was brave because he had his trust in Christ. But look at this. He says, uh, uh, the first thing I would like us to notice when we are evangelizing, don't take offense if someone makes fun of you or, or acts as if you're crazy. Look at verse number 17. So he was reasoning in a synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and in the marketplace every day with those who, had ha who happened to be present. And also some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with them. Some were saying, what would this idol babbler have to say? Does Paul lash back? He says, you guys are so stupid. All these statues, what are you doing? No, Paul doesn't say that. Paul understands that it is a spiritual battle. And if he were to lash back, Satan wins. Satan wins. Satan was using these men to try to get under his skin so that he can get frustrated and get out of town. And then no one would get the gospel in Athens. No, Paul didn't allow that to happen because Paul knew that they were spiritually weak. Don't let any... Uh, if someone teases you, if it's even your friends, your best friends, your own parents, your family, don't let that bother you. Jesus didn't let it bother him. They tried hard to get under his skin. Paul doesn't let that happen. So these philosophers, and I'm not going to go into the history about these people, but let's just say that they were prideful and they were all about human knowledge. The gospel was a foolishness to them. and We'll see that here in a moment. But if you go down to verse 22... Paul starts to preach to them. He has a message for them. And what we're going to see here, uh, uh, point number two, is that uh, we need to find a reason to compliment who we're trying to evangelize. Even if they're the worst person in the world, find something to compliment them about. Because it helps them to relax. It helps them to see that, you know, he's not such a bad guy. Verse 22, so Paul stood in the midst of the Arabicus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. That's a very, he doesn't say it's a good thing or a bad thing. He just says, I observe you are very religious in all respects. You know, everybody is religious. Did you know that? <laughs> but only a small percentage are religious to the truth. But we're all religious to something to ourselves, to an idol, or to the true God, to sports. Uh, who is our God? We're all religious to something. But he, he states this because he, he, he's seen the, uh, the altar with the inscription to an unknown God. So he knows that they're religious in, in some respect. He finds a reason to compliment them. I talk to people every once in a while and They'll say, uh, yeah, well, you know, I, I appreciate you uh, extending your invitation that we can you know, come out to uh, Bible study, but I've been, a, I've been attending, attending this uh, particular denomination for 30 years now. And I say, oh, that is wonderful. I wish there were more who were as dedicated as you were to, to you know, stay faithful. That's, that's so great. Now, it's good to be faithful and dedicated and good to be one who can be trusted, but uh, everything else is not good. They're following some type of man-made doctrine, but you want to find something. That's wonderful. It makes people feel good. It, it allows them to put their guard down. Instead of, they might be expecting you to start...
hitting them with the Bible. But you say, oh, that's, that's good. Oh, really? Paul finds a way to compliment them. So he didn't take offense to their words. He finds a way to compliment them. And number three, uh, we need to uh, see that he um, exposes the problem. We have to let them know that there is a problem. If you do not convince someone that they are in sin, why will they need to listen to anything you have to say? They won't. They say, hey, I'm fine. I'm fine. I love my life. Well, let me explain to you what is happening in the spiritual world. He says in verse 23, For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I, found also, I, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. So, these men were all about knowledge, and, and Paul is saying that you are ignorant in one particular area. And so, since they love to hear new things and learn to gain knowledge, uh, Paul was kind of inviting them. I've got something to tell you, if you like to learn. Now, the problem is, it's that you're worshiping a God that you do not know. So I have a solution. When you point out a problem, you better give a solution. The solution was that I will tell you who the true God is so that you won't have to be ignorant anymore. So that you won't have to worship uh, these idols that were uh, populating the city in such a bad way. Let's look at his, his sermon and note a few things here. Verse 24, he said, The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So first, he's telling uh, these people that the God, the true God was not made. These idols were made by your hands. The true God... It was not made. The true God has always existed. He is the self, uh, the self, uh, the word is, the self-existent, the great I am. Thank you. <laughs> That's what Moses said. Who, what should I tell him? Who should I tell him sent me? Tell him I am who I am sent you. The self-existent one. Not one who was created by some man's hands. And because, you know, these philosophers and Epicureans, they were proud of who they were. They are proud of these, these statues that they made. So they say, you know, we did this. We did this. Well, look at verse 25. He says, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. So Paul now is explaining uh, the importance of knowing this true God because he gives life and breath to all things. He's created all things. This sounds like a God you want to be on. You want to be on his good side, right? That statue won't do anything to you. Matter of fact, you can kick it over. It won't even get up and, and do anything. So he's explaining the true God and he goes on to say, in verse 26, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined the appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. So what I'm trying to say is God is in control. He is in control. Even when it seems like the earth is out of control, God is still in control. He allows certain things to happen. And if you are doing his will, you're fine. You're just fine. Even if it seems like the world is crumbling around you, you are just fine if you are in God's will. The bad things that happen to us or around us, he can use those things to strengthen you so that you can become more like Christ. So we don't have to worry about anything like that. Verse 27, that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each of us. So in other words, God has created this world and all of the beautiful things in this world. And when we observe this world, we should, we should say there's a God somewhere. Someone had to have designed this beautiful place. Someone had to have designed this beautiful person. 
Someone had to design the baby that came out of my wife's womb. It didn't happen by accident. And these things should cause us to, to look and to grope and to want to find and diligently search for the truth. These people were searching, but they were never content. They were just wanting to hear something new. That's the only reason they were uh, listening to Paul in this context. Verse 28, uh, he says, For in him we live and move and exist, even as, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. So we see Paul giving credit to some of their uh, beloved teachers and poets. Here's another way that we can uh, win someone over. Find out what they like. Find out what they like to do in, in, their, in their spare time, their hobbies and things like that. And... Uh, if you know anything about it, talk to them about it. He says, hey, I know one of your, I know one of your poets. I, I've read some of his poetry. Oh, really? Yes. I've read some of his poetry. And a statement that he's made uh, can add to this point that I'm making. Even he understood. Let's look at the last point as far as evangelizing. We've, we've noticed that uh, first you've got to have a burning passion. You've got to be wanting to help change lives. You've got to be disgusted and, and offended in, in your heart when you see sin. David said, through your precepts I get understanding and I hate every false way. If you hate every false way, you cannot help but to get up and get to work. So we see that you have to first understand that don't allow anybody's words to bother you. If they don't understand, they're... It's a spiritual battle, and they don't understand yet. Don't let anybody, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but find a reason to compliment. Meet people where they are and try to point out what they're doing good. Explain the God, the true God. And here we are at the last point. Don't be afraid to extend an invitation. Don't be afraid to extend an invitation. You've, you've pointed out the problem. They're worshiping an unknown God. You've given them a solution. He's explaining who God is. And, and if you notice, Paul hasn't used one verse. Have you noticed that? He doesn't refer to any Old Testament scripture or New Testament scripture. Why? Because they don't even know, they don't know any scripture. What is, what is it to them if they don't know scripture? You can't beat somebody over the head with quoting scriptures, quoting scripture, go to this verse, go to that verse, go to this verse. All you're doing is making them dizzy. Try to meet them where they are. And try to build up so that you can use scripture. But here we see that he will extend the invitation and, and help them understand that there is a sense of urgency. There is a sense of urgency. Look at verse 29. He says, being the children of God, we ought not to think that the, that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. What, by the way, how do you worship a false god? How do you worship a false God any way you want to if you made the God you can worship it any way you want to that's why people worship false gods that's why the children of Israel formed that golden calf they learned that back in Egypt look at verse 30 therefore that means he's wrapping this up Based on everything I said, having overlooked the times of ignorance, you know, he's referring all the way back to verse 23 when he says, therefore what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. He says, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. All people, not just some, all people. Some preach that you uh, uh, are born in sin. And uh, since God has not, chose you, has not chosen you, you cannot go to heaven. I'm sorry. You weren't chosen. That's false. God is not a creator uh, who would destroy just because... No. God is loving. That's why he demands that all men repent everywhere. Why? Why should we repent from our sins? Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world. 
in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. This God that I've been speaking about, not only is he in control, not only is he the creator, but he will judge us at the end. He has fixed a day. He has a calendar, and he says, on this day will Christ return. You better be ready. You've got to be ready. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to repent because that man, Christ Jesus, whom we should all believe in because he's furnished us proof of his resurrection. We cannot find his body. The tomb is still empty because he resurrected. We must follow him. Verse 32, here's the part where you know, we see the response. Now, when they heard of this resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. <laughs> oh, this is so funny. You know what? That's, we appreciate you coming and telling us about this, this funny story. You know, when they called him an idol babbler earlier, what that means is that he's just somebody who's collected thoughts from here and there and put it together, and now this is his story. But actually, that is what the philosophers did. They listened to stories here and there, and they put it together and had their own thoughts. Paul gave evidence for all of his thoughts. He put it all together for them. He says, we have no excuse, but because we have all proof that he was raised from the dead. And they laughed. Don't, don't be uh, surprised if people laugh at you. It's okay. It's okay. One day they might come back to you and say, I'm so glad you sowed that seed in my heart. I thought it was a joke at first, but you saved my soul. But others said, we shall hear you again concerning this life. But here's the good part. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysus, the Areopagite. She was one of the judge, or he was one of the judges. And a, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. He did it when some souls. That's proof that what he said made sense and that it was convincing. What he, said, what he said makes sense to them and they heard the truth of the gospel and the Bible said they believed. That word considered to be a synodiki is one word that uh, sums up uh, the, the whole scheme of redemption. They believed, meaning they obeyed. They heard the gospel they, re- they believed it. They repented of their sins. They confessed Christ as the Son of God, and they were baptized. Luke doesn't have to write all that out. He's, he's already explained it all the way back in chapter 2 and chapter 3. So now he can use uh, this word believe uh, as us all understanding what he means by it. So what do you say when you see a mess? A person who is completely lost. Someone who has no idea who God is. Where do you start? Well, you meet them where they are. You explain to them who God is. You start at the beginning. Go to Genesis. Start at the beginning. Don't get nervous. Don't get overwhelmed. Don't, don't try to bite off more than you chew. One step at a time. Don't, don't worry if they make fun of you. Don't worry if they sneer at you or, or whatever. You know, just... Sow the seed, and God will be pleased. It's a mess that can be cleaned up. I was a mess. I'm sure most of you can say I was a mess at one point. And God, through his grace and his patience and his love, has allowed me to stand here today and has allowed you to sit here today. Let us not wait until Christ returns to make a decision. Make it before he returns so that you can be with him on your way up to heaven. Repent and be baptized that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The same promise that was spoken 2,000 years ago is the same promise that we speak today. If you want to do that, if you desire to do that, please stand at this time as we sing our invitation song. I was sinking deep and sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. 
From the waters lifted me, how safe am I? Love lifted me, love lifted me. Love lifted.